On March 17, 1861, Italy, after centuries of invasion and internal strife, was finally united under one king. But why was it this period, in particular, that gave rise to the creation of a unified Italian state, when other European powers, such as Britain, France, and Russia, had been well established centuries prior? I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian, and today we'll be discussing the topic of Italian unification. But first, today's video is sponsored by Total Battle. Total Battle is a free online strategy game that we'll be taking a look at towards the end of this video. Their unique tracking link can be found in the description below. And now, let's take a look at the state of Italy before unification. To help us do this, James from the YouTube channel Sweeney will be joining us. Hi Griff. Like the ancient Greeks, Italians have historically identified with their respective city-states as opposed to a distinct Italian nationality. These city-states were often governed by foreign powers, but by the dawn of the Renaissance, a number of independent regional states emerged. These budding principalities were eager to advance their own interests and regularly waged war with one another. In times of invasion, they sometimes aligned themselves not with their Italian counterparts, but with the invaders, allowing Italy to become a playground for the armies of Spain, France, and the Holy Roman Empire during the 15th and 16th centuries. In History of Nations, Italy, Tara Kuhlhofer asserts that Italy must be the most invaded country in the world, and Lombardy, one of the world's greatest battlefields. Thanks, James. If you guys haven't already, please check out the channel Sweeney. You can find the link in the description below. He actually created an entire video series on the broad history of Italy. You should definitely check that out. Now back to the video. The 16th and 17th centuries marked a rebirth of culture and mercantilism in northern Italy, and a national consciousness began to develop due to figures such as Dante Alighieri, Niccolo Machiavelli, and Cesare Borgia, who were all considered the forefathers, in some way, shape, or form, of a united Italy. Their influence would sputter and die out, however, as the Renaissance drew to a close, and Italy became overshadowed by the colonial powers of Europe. As the glory and splendor of Florence and Venice faded, the cities of the Atlantic seaboard surpassed them in wealth and status. What followed from the 1700s to the early 1800s is referred to by some historians as the Forgotten Centuries, but Napoleon's invasion of Italy abruptly shattered this period of relative calm. In the words of Kohlhofer, Napoleonic armies brought with them the germs of liberalism, fostered by the French Revolution of 1789, and introduced a minor industrial revolution, sufficient at least to provide some of the war equipment required. When Napoleon's empire collapsed, the masses celebrated his defeat, having been agitated by conscription and heavy taxes. They hoped for a return to the status quo, along with the lax rule of a duke or pope. But Napoleon's mark had been made. Many of the individuals that would go on to spearhead the Italian nationalist movement were descended from the people who profited financially and politically under French jurisdiction. Nationalist sentiments had been stoked in this exclusive Italian social class, and secret societies began cropping up all across the nation. So what was the political landscape like after Napoleon's final exile? Well, between 1815 and 1848, Naples continued to be subjected to Bourbon rule, and Tuscany, Milan, and Venice were controlled by the Austrians. During this period, some of the Italians began to realize that the type of centralized government they had been administered by under Napoleon could improve quality of life and protect their fiscal interests to a greater degree than the Habsburg or Bourbon governments did. As the Industrial Revolution swept across Europe, an expanding Italian middle class saw value in roads, railways, and an increasingly interconnected network of markets. Before we begin explaining how the war broke out, let's introduce some of the figures that shaped the course of the so-called Risorgimento and embedded themselves in Italian history. The first is Giuseppe Mazzini, who was one of the earliest revolutionary spokesmen. He produced revolutionary writings abroad after being banished from Genoa and Piedmont. Mazzini was of the staunch conviction that the matter of Italian unification was a divine duty ordained by God himself. He also stressed Italian self-realization without the intervention of foreign powers. His ultimate vision was that of a utopian Italian republic that respected the rights of the everyman. At one point, he was considered the de facto leader of the Italian revolutionary movement, but this position would be usurped by Camillo Benso, the Count of Cavour, a shrewd and, some would say, Machiavellian politician. Cavour ended up orchestrating most of the political maneuvering that led to the eventual Italian unification. By 1861, the year of Cavour's death, the only Italian territories not united under him and his liege, Victor Emmanuel II, were the city of Rome itself and Austrian-controlled Venice. 
The final character we'll be elaborating on is Giuseppe Garibaldi, a gruff and honest man and an accomplished guerrilla leader whose tactical prowess made him an incredibly useful asset to the Italian struggle for independence against the Austrians. Garibaldi was known for his frugality, preferring to sleep on a straw bed and wash his own clothes, even when staying in palaces. He had a general disinterest for politics and holding office, and although he paraded around as a Republican, he became supportive of the idea of a dictatorship to force liberty on the people of Italy. All three of these figures distrusted and intensely disliked one another, but each succeeded in advancing the cause of Italian unification, much like Alighieri, Machiavelli, and Borgia once did. In 1848, revolution in France once more spilled over in the Italian peninsula. This led to the subjugated peoples of Milan and Venice to take up arms against their Austrian rulers. The Neapolitans, meanwhile, were in open revolt against the Bourbon regime that ruled their country. In recognition of this turbulent state of affairs, Charles Albert, the King of Piedmont Sardinia, declared war on Austria, which marked the official start of the First Italian War of Independence. However, the Neapolitans' early withdrawal, coupled with the disagreements with the Milanese and Piedmontese, led to an Austrian victory, and Charles Albert was forced to abdicate to Victor Emmanuel II. The Piedmontese were also forced to pay 65 million francs in reparation to Austria. But Piedmont was not deterred. A second Italian war for independence broke out in 1859, when Piedmont Sardinia managed to secure a secret defensive pact with France. Because the pact was purely defensive, Cavour, the Prime Minister of Piedmont Sardinia at the time, resolved to provoke the Austrians into fighting. He accomplished this by stationing troops close to the border, prompting the Habsburg government to issue an ultimatum that was rejected. The war had begun. But not long after, France entered into secret negotiations with Austria, fearing the possibility of Prussian involvement. An armistice would be signed, which effectively granted Sardinia Piedmont the state of Lombardy, but ensured Austria would retain control over the central states of Italy, much to Emmanuel's dismay. This latter term was never enforced, however, and the French made no attempt to expel the Italian garrisons that then assumed control over the region since the outbreak of the war. In return for French backing, Cavour ceded Nice and Savoy to France. This decision enraged the Italian's preeminent general during the conflict, Giuseppe Garibaldi. Garibaldi promptly launched an expedition against Sicily in an act of borderline mutiny, which resulted in its annexation in his name. Meanwhile, Cavour secured the incorporation of the Duchies of Parma, Modena, the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, and the Papal States, with the exception of Rome. Cavour's rapid expansion forced Garibaldi to cede his control of Naples and Sicily to Emmanuel II after the Piedmontese army marched south through their newly acquired territories. Six years later, following the conclusion of the Third and Final War of Italian Independence, which was part of the Austro-Prussian War, Venice was seized from the Austrians, and the provinces of Italy were unified under one government. But the Papal State was still guarded by Napoleon III. After Napoleon lost to the Prussians during the Franco-Prussian War, however, France withdrew from Rome, and the capture of Rome in 1870 ensued, fully uniting Italy. After unification, the newly created state of Italy faced a number of roadblocks that stood in the way of progress. For one, the majority of the middle class and aristocracy alike had never truly been won over by the revolutionary ideals that trickled down from France. In addition, the Italian parliament experienced gridlock as socialists and liberals failed to compromise on even the most basic pieces of legislation. To conclude, we'll cite Serge Hughes, a professor at Hunter College. He describes how, in the 1870s, the cry of Risorgimento leaders was, now that we have made Italy, we must make Italians. But decades passed, and Italians were still as disunited as ever. These issues would continue to plague Italy throughout the 19th century, and even today. As I mentioned before, today's video is sponsored by Total Battle. This game allows you to build up a sprawling city, train a massive army, and join a clan to take part in an exciting online multiplayer experience. Thanks for watching. I'd like to thank my general staff on Patreon Jake Hart, John Graham, James Thompson, Derek Bellow, Kevin Rulane, Jim Talbot, Dimitri Stillerman, Jeff Antelik, Patrick Reardon, Ben Natividad, Joe Crispin, Emmanuel Kang, Ademski, and everyone else listed on screen. I'd also like to thank those working on the Armchair History team for making this video possible. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time with the Battle of Stalingrad.